Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much for being here. My name is Dr. Rodrigo Prino from Politics and Public Policy here at Flinders University. And we're here today, as you all know, to talk about the first 100 days of the presidency of Donald Trump. So before we start, I would like to thank very much the uh, faculty of social and behavioral sciences, in particular the, the marketing team, Laura Bree and Olga, for organizing this, the OCE and Eddie for uh, recording this and sending it over to uh, our Facebook page, live as it happens, and uh, Professor Don DeBats for all his help behind the scenes uh, for organizing this with me. Um, so thank you all for being here, and I also welcome our guests that are following us live on Facebook. Um, as this is being broadcast live online. Um, so today we will be uh, having a uh, panel discussion, a round table type of discussion, so like an informal discussion with a number of esteemed guests that I thank for being here with us today. And afterwards we will have a Q&A session with Professor Don DeBats that will happen both with you guys here live uh, with us and with anyone on Facebook. So if you are following it us here, um, at the end, please ask questions if you have any. And those of you who are following us live on Facebook, please post your questions at the uh, events page, and we will uh, uh, be addressing them at the end of the discussion. Um, so I have a number of guests here, some from the university, some from outside. Of course, we have Congressman Jim McDermott. Thank you very much for joining us here and for being here visiting uh, Flinders University. Um, to his left, I have Dr. Marianne Kelton. Dr. Prudence Flower, uh, Professor Don DeBats, and to my right, Dr. Mikhail Balaev, Professor David Stoes, and uh, Dr. Josh Newman. We will be joined as well by Associate Professor Cassandra Starr um, as soon as possible. So, why 100 days? Why do we even talk about 100 days? Well, this story of the 100 days starts with Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he actually accomplished a lot in the first 100 days of his presidency. That's the time when he started to put forward all his New Deal legislation. Um, it was a very productive 100 days, probably almost certainly the most productive 100 days in any presidency in the United States before or after him. But it is a bit of an arbitrary landmark, isn't it? It's 100 days. What does it mean? It's a nice round number. It's a little over three months, but not quite. Um, it's a completely arbitrary um, landmark. There is no constitutional basis in the American constitutional Constitution, and there is not even a procedural type of basis. There is no reason why anything done in the first 100 days should be more or less successful than it is throughout the rest of the presidency. Um, that being said, the media loves it. We know. The media has been talking about the 100 days for a while. We are here talking about the 100 days, so we love it as well. Um, but also candidates love it. So let me read you what candidate Donald Trump said um, in October 2016. So at the very end of the election, he said, and I quote, My reform plan will lift millions out of poverty, raise wages dramatically, and create at least 25 million new jobs in the next 10 years. And we can enact the whole plan in the first 100 days, and we will. So now the 100 days have come, and Donald Trump changed tune. In fact, four days ago, he posted on Twitter, and again, I quote, no matter how much I accomplished during the ridiculous standard of the first 100 days, and it has been a lot, including the Supreme Court, media will kill. So now it's a ridiculous standard, right? Um, that being said, it is an arbitrary um, <coughs> landmark, as I said before, but that being said, there is research in political science that actually shows that the first 100 days are a little bit special. Um, we call it the honeymoon period, especially when the president and Congress belong to the same party. There is this sort of honeymoon moment when it is easier to pass legislation. So, you know, there is no actual reason why that would be, but it does happen, and it has been shown empirically that it does happen. Um, before I let uh, give the word to our guests, I would like to um, spend a second talking about a few accomplishments that actually happened in the first 100 days. The Washington Post has a fantastic website where they're tracking every single promise made by uh, Donald Trump in the campaign trail. And looking at that, there are literally five things that Donald Trump did in the first 100 days. So five, prom five campaign promises that were actually um, um, uh, uh, kept during the first 100 days. 
First of all, he imposed a lifetime ban on White House officials lobbying on behalf of foreign government. Second, he now uh, re uh, requires that for every new federal regulation, two existing regulations must be eliminated. So that has been done as well. Number three, he withdrew the U.S. from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Number four, he lifted the Obama-Clinton roadblocks against vital infrastructure, as he calls them, um, such as Dakota Access and the Keystone Pipelines. So these four things were done, and they were done by executive order. So he doesn't need anyone or anything to actually accomplish it. He just literally goes there, signs the order, and that is done. Most of the time, we saw the federal judges sometimes don't like the orders that he issued. So, uh, assuming that the judiciary then doesn't do anything about them, they are fairly easy to accomplish. He did accomplish one thing that required a vote in Congress. He nominated and confirmed Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. Um, that happened with a vote from the Senate, so not the entire Congress. The presidential nominations get confirmed by the Senate alone. And in order to actually arrive to this confirmation, they had to use a so-called nuclear option. They eliminated filibustering for the um, for not for Supreme Court nomination only. So it was even that was very hard to accomplish. These are the five things he has done um, in the first 100, the five cap promises um, that he made during the campaign trail. That being said, let's move on and let's talk um, to our. Guests, let's start with Congressman Jim McDermott. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you for being here at Flinders University. Um, Congressman, you were elected to the U.S. House of Representatives for the first time in 19, 1988, which means you took office in January 1989. This means that you have seen from the inside of the U.S. Congress um, the first 100 days of George Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and then Barack Obama. So how is Trump different from these previous experiences you had in the Congress? Well, thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I just finished teaching, of course, at the University of Washington on the first 100 days. And I started each class by saying, I don't know what's happening in Washington, D.C. I have watched four of these transitions go on, and this is the most chaotic, the most unpredictable, the most unproductive transition I've ever seen. Uh, the first thing the president has to do during the transition period is choose the people who will fill the slots in the government to replace those who leave. There's 4,000 jobs. It's called the Plum Book, and you have to fill in a name for everybody in the State Department, in the Treasury, in the Defense Department, all these jobs, you have to vet 4,000 people and put them in place. His process is, there. he's got dozens of jobs at the State Department that are still not, there's no one there, no one running the show. Uh, the same is true of the Defense Department, and that's true through labor and education and across, across the board. Because he did not take that part of it seriously. He thought he could bring in a very small group of people and run the government without the bureaucracy. He really had in mind to undermine the, the uh, bureaucracy of government. The second thing is <clears throat> the president had the understanding that he was a business executive. He ran a big company and when he said you do this, you do it or you're fired. And that's the end of that. Now when you're dealing with the Congress, 700,000 people sent me to Washington, D.C., not the President of the United States. And he does not control me. Those 700,000 people who sent me control me. And I don't have to. He can't fire me. He doesn't like me. He's stuck with me in this place. And he's got 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate, all who've been elected independently, who can say to him, Mr. President, you're wrong. I'm not going to do it. He never understood that. The thing that was, I think, most difficult or most clear, um, and I, in my course, I'm a, I'm a Democrat. I've been involved in politics for 46 years and known as a Democrat. But I brought in Republicans into my course because I wanted the students to hear both sides. And my <clears throat> one of the former senators in the state of Washington, Slade Gordon, said, the president has two characteristics which make him absolutely the worst presidential candidate we've ever had in my party. He's arrogant and ignorant. Now, ignorance 
you can be ignorant of something, but you can learn. Ignorance can be overcome by education. That's what goes on. Arrogance is another story. If you're so arrogant that you don't think you're ignorant, it's hard to educate you. Because what have you got to learn? You're already, you already know everything. And we've heard the president say, I'm the smartest man in the room, and I'm the, I'm the best at this and my business and this and blah, blah. Everything is the best that he did. Well, that kind of arrogance, when you're coming up against the Congress, is bound to give you real problems. And he's had one failure after another with anything where he had to have a vote, as the moderator has said. Uh, he signed executive orders. You can sit in the office and sign stuff. But who says it's going to happen out there? And you said you're going to have to re remove two regulations for every new regulation you put in? He doesn't understand the Federal Register. He doesn't understand all the mechanisms of government that he's dealing with. And so he really um, has been, this has been the most unproductive first 100 days I've ever seen. The reason the 100 days is taken it's a symbol sent to the American people. You've elected me, and I'm now going to show you what I'm going to do for the next four years. And I'm going to get it rolling in this first hundred days, and I will complete it by the end of my four years. That's the significance of that hundred days. In his case, the health care reform, we, nobody knows where that is. Tax reform, nobody knows where that is. Immigration reform, nobody knows where that is. Building a wall with Mexico, he just took that off the table. This morning's Australian, I read, it's taken off the table because he says, I'll get to it later. Well, he has not been able to negotiate anything with the Congress up to this point, except for uh, the replacement of the one Supreme Court justice. And he had to do that by, by the filibuster rule has been there for a hundred years, and he had to get the Senate to overturn a hundred-year-old rule to finally get it in because the Democrats were going to prevent Gorsuch from becoming a new Supreme Court justice. So this president has never figured out what governance is all about. Governance is not running a big corporation. You are not king. You are not the czar. You are not the emperor. You are not the dictator. You're not any. You are a part of an, a, demo, a democratically elected government, and it all has to work together. Ours is put together with all kinds of checks and balances in it. <coughs> and the president never understood the checks and balances he was going to run up against. The first thing he did was put out that ban on Muslims coming to the United States. Five judges stood up the next day and said, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And, and he never saw that coming because the guy he talked to to write that with didn't know either. So they never he never consulted. If he had talked to any member of Congress would have told him, Mr. President, this isn't going to work. But he didn't do that. He, he was the executive. He said, this is what's going to happen. And lo and behold, it didn't. So we're in a period now where we are waiting to see if he learns anything about working with the Congress to get anything with the Congress. And everybody in the United States is waiting to find out, too. Congressman, you, you mentioned these thousands of jobs that he needs to appoint and put people in place, right? Now, when you get that nomination from the political party, you become the leader of the political party. Now, in political science, we teach that very often. A leader of a party with thousands of jobs to give to people from his or her party, that's, a, that's, that's a, something that a leader of a party really likes to be able to do. Now, he put up a website asking for expressions of interest. Now, I have seen that done before. I don't know if you have seen that done before in the United States. I have seen that done before in Italy, when Silvio Berlusconi first got elected. He put up, I, I was living in Italy, and he put up a website. And, well, no website at that, but he had TV ads where he was asking us, well, do you want to work in government? Call this number. Now, have you seen that done before in the United States in, at any level of government? I can tell you my own personal experience. Uh, in 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected president of the United States. And our senator from the state of Washington was Warren Magnuson. Warren Magnuson took the plum book, took all 4,000 jobs, and he penciled in a name by each single, every one of them. 
to present to the president to say, here are the people that I think you should point to those jobs. My name, I got into that because they called me up and said, do you want to be the assistant secretary of health? I'm a physician. And they said, do you want to be? And I said, well, do I have to take it? They said, no, 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 we just want to put your name in the book. Because every single one of those 4,000 were filled in by that senator. And every senator hands the same kind of book to the president. This guy ignored that whole system of how you get qualified people. Because Magnuson had vetted me, and he knew that I would not embarrass him, or he wouldn't have put my name in the book. And the president's biggest problem is when he's trying to find 4,000 people is, how do you find people who aren't going to embarrass you, who don't have something in their background that will come back and bite me because I appointed them? But uh, there's never been that, that the Berlusconi thing sounds a lot like Bush or a lot like uh, Trump in the sense that uh, he, he just thinks still people, good, good people will show up. People who answer an ad like that, you've got to be careful. <laughs> who, it, who it is that types in and says, I would like to be the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> this, this is not where you find good government people. It's true. And that, that, that like leads um, very nicely into Mikhail's um, air of expertise. So, Mikhail, dur during the presidential campaign, one of the major points of the Trump campaign was that Hillary Clinton had corporate ties and was in the pocket of some of the largest corporations in America and around the world. Now, another important point was that Trump, being, being an outsider, he was going to drain the swamp in Washington, right? That he kept talking about this swamp over and over. Now, Trump is a corporation, right? He's, even his own name is trademarked. His cabinet is now filled with CEOs and people with very strong and clear corporate ties. Many even argue that the few things that, that have been done so far only really benefit the corporations. And that goes from all the way from internet service providers, we all know what happened there, um, all the way to coal mining companies. Now, what swamp is he trying to do? Well, that depends how you define swamp, I guess. <laughs> and it's never been defined. So. Uh, what, what from the original claims that he made during the campaign, we can infer that by the swamp he meant this, you know, sort of corporate political relationship between Washington and ignoring of the working people, something that he, you know, portrayed himself as he would be standing up for. And what he is doing, he is doing pretty much the conventional, uh, you know, kind of Republican conservative staffing of the White House. And as, as uh, Senator McDermott pointed out, uh, that uh, very few positions have been filled. They've been filled on the top. But the major policy work doesn't, is not created by the top. It's created by the people who are selected by the people at the top. So we have uh, the secretaries, but the assistant secretaries, and people below them who have to be, some of them nominated, some of them uh, will have to be appointed. Uh, the, that, that part has been absent, so we have sort of the head, but we don't have the body. Uh, judging by the head, there are a lot of corporate ties, and uh, you know, primarily with the uh, banking industry, Goldman Sachs, as, as very well represented right now in the government. Um, uh, the energy corporations uh, have strong ties to the government. Uh, on the other hand, he appointed uh, traditional politicians, uh, in uh, positions, and some uh, appointments were for the sort of, you know, payback uh, for the for the former supporters. So, um, but uh, no, nowhere near, from however you think about the swamp, nowhere near we are approaching any kind of draining of uh, any swamp that we're going to be So that's. Uh, and also, I think you, to a certain extent, you, you expect some continuity because so, some of these positions, again, that the 4,000 we were talking about before, it's not only heads of departments, secretary of this, secretary of that, it's people that actually are way below that level. And it, it's competence that are, um, those posts are not necessarily political. You need to know what you're doing. You need to be some, somehow um, familiar with the department, with the actual object of, of what you're doing. So the, uh, there was something else that he did. He seemed usually presidents leave people in place until they get the replacements confirmed. Because remember, according to the U.S. Constitution, these replacements have to, presidential nominations have to be confirmed by the Senate. 
So it's not literally, I will take you out and I will put somebody else in your place. There is a process that goes through. And he apparently even started sending people home and leaving these places vacant. What, what do you think, Congressman, is the <coughs> consequence for government when you leave places empty? His ignorance of how government operates was so obvious in the State Department where he had ambassadors removed all over the world and thinking that he could tomorrow send somebody to replace them. He can nominate them. They then have to be confirmed by the Senate, which may take anywhere from a week to a month to six months. So he, he had no concept of leaving people in place until the replacement was in the plane going out there. At that point, they leave the job. And so he left big vacancies all over the world. Uh, and, and he did that, the same thing in, in um, parts of the bureaucracy where people need to have decisions made. There is nobody sitting there who's going to sign it and say, this is OK to do, until they find out who's going to be on top of the organization. Because the best way to get yourself fired is to make a decision before the boss arrives. The boss may come in and say, who did that? Oh, it was that guy. He's out of here. And so you have to, there, that, the way the bureaucracy operates, he had no idea because he was used to hiring and firing at will. I mean, as an executive of a big business, he fired people all the time. He ran a TV show called The Apprentice, right? You're fired. You're out of here. I mean, that kind of stuff just doesn't happen in government. There's always a process. And you must respect that process because that's how we have a stable government and that's how we get people in who know what they're doing. People aren't going to go into government if they can be fired tomorrow for saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. They want to have a process. Exactly. Let's move on to, to some of the main issues. Let's talk for a second to Professor David Stoes. Um, so probably the single largest campaign promise from Donald <coughs> Trump was that he was going to get rid of Obamacare. Then at a certain point of the campaign, he started talking about repeal and replace. So it started with let's get rid of it, then it became let's repeal and replace Obamacare. Um, he's always been very vague when it comes to telling us what he, had, he was planning um, um, to replace Obamacare with. No actual explanation of what is, um, what's coming after Obamacare. Um, then when pressed by a journalist, he went as far as saying that he was going to take care of everybody. That's, that's a quote from him. I will take care of everybody when it comes to health care. Then after the inauguration, he came up with the famous, who knew health care was that healthcare? <laughs> no, I think you did. I, I have, I have a, a small impression that most people around this table did think it was that complicated. Um, but he, as well as the Republican leadership in Congress, failed miserably then in the quest to repeal and replace Obamacare. Um, but the fight is not over yet. Do you think they have learned from the first 100 days? And if they have, what do you think is Trump's next move going to look like in the healthcare dimension? Well, for purposes of clarification, we all understand that Obamacare is the same as the Affordable Care Act, which was passed in 2010 which essentially mandated the provision of uh, insurance for Americans, complemented by the expansion of Medicaid throughout the states. So altogether, this was uh, a very corporate-oriented reform. And nonetheless, it antagonized Republicans no end, so that by the time Donald Trump became president, the Congress had voted something like 40 to 50 times to repeal the Affordable Care Act. So the question becomes obvious, well, so what do you replace that with? Uh, and Donald Trump had vowed on day one to repeal Obamacare. So there's a mad scramble to find a replacement for that, which turned out to be the Affordable Care Act, uh, excuse me, the uh, American Health Care Act. The American Health Act was essentially dead on arrival because it skewered too many stakeholders. Um, a month ago, I had a wonderful opportunity to talk with your former Prime Minister, John Howard, about health care because he was very much engaged in Australia's Medicare program, keenly interested in the Affordable Care Act and how that was going to be managed in the United States. Uh, 
uh, and I got a, a laugh out of John Howard by citing a former Democratic member of Congress from what we call the left coast in the United States, who said, yeah, uh, the Trump administration is going to repeal Obamacare and replace it with the Affordable Care Act. That congressman was Jim McDermott. <laughs> So why, why would the Trump administration have such difficulty in repealing something that is so antagonistic with regard to the Republican Party? It, it has to do with three basic stakeholders who are very much invested in this. The first group of stakeholders represents 20 million Americans who didn't have health insurance before. Uh, and there's a real question about whether or not the 2018 election won't be a referendum on what happens to those 20 million Americans if, in fact, their health care uh, is taken away from them. Uh, the other two stakeholders are really quite interesting. Uh, the second group of stakeholders represents Republican governors who have, in fact, expanded the Medicaid program. They have a problem, which is if Obamacare is repealed, then suddenly they're faced with millions of poor people who then have to have their health care addressed. And that expense will fall directly on state government. So we have we have Republican governors such as John Kasich who are really concerned about this and they will be verbal about that. Concerned. They don't want to be stuck with the tab of Donald Trump's short-sightedness. The third stakeholder group is particularly fascinating. It has everything to do with the way the Affordable Care Act was structured, which was it encouraged health insurers to provide insurance to low-income Americans and provided subsidies for those people who couldn't afford health insurance premiums. So we get some very large corporate health insurers very much engaged in the Affordable Care Act. This was put in place in 2010. Fast forward by 2017, we have companies like United Healthcare, Aetna, Humana, which have built business models around those government subsidy uh, health insurance premiums. And they are not happy about the idea of having <coughs> that revenue flow retracted. So you put those things together, and what you have is something that is really not just complicated, but it's politically um, powerful, and it represents a minefield for the Trump administration. So I think those are some of the primary reasons why this has become a really difficult issue for the Trump administration. There's, there's another issue here which I find particularly fascinating, and that was, if you think about health care in the United States, this is very much related to economics, but it's also related to the quality of health for Americans. And we've got some pretty good indicators of that, which come out of epidemiology. So that when the uh, Affordable Care Act was being crafted and progressives were arguing for this, this is the last chunk in the American welfare state uh, infrastructure, they, they were arguing that universalizing health insurance in the United States would save 50,000 lives. Well, reverse the logic here. So, what does that mean if you retract the Affordable Care Act? Well, it means there will be casualties. And the casualties will literally be in the tens of thousands. Uh, the epidemiologists will be able to calculate that with greater specificity, but it will be the newspapers who identify Rod as the person who is unable to get dialysis. And as a result of that, Rod ends up being a casualty of Trump care. Exactly. 
But politically speaking, I don't know, I don't know if maybe also the conversation wants to pitch in and, and there's our baby dog. Um, politically speaking, did he maybe go too quick to try to do something? Because if, if we, like, looking, I've, I've been looking back at other presidents, right? And Obama couldn't do Obamacare in another days or at the beginning of the term. But there was that sort of, like, sense that, we were, that they were moving forward towards Obamacare. Um, George W. Bush, of course, it was September 11th, but, but uh, George W. Bush was, um, um, his thing was education reform. So he, he couldn't have done that in the first 100, but there was a sense that he was moving forward towards its sort of goal. Now, did Trump try to pull the trigger too quickly? Um, even if he were to replace Obamacare with Obamacare, as you said, um, he could have done that in a way that looks like He's, he's replacing that with something slightly different if he had worked harder on that. So did he, did he pull the trigger too quick on that? Well, I think so. Uh, there's a real question here as to whether or not there is any foresight to much of anything that's going to happen with the Trump administration. Certainly, with <coughs> regard to the, the masterful choreography that's necessary in order to leverage major policy change. Uh, and you see that with George W. Bush in uh, education where he reached across the aisle to take Kennedy. Uh, and they crafted something that was reasonable. Uh, it was retracted several years later, but nonetheless, that's how you go about doing that. And I think Jim McDermott can speak very eloquently about bipartisan uh, collaboration in order to do something of this magnitude. But Donald Trump is, I think, uh, arrogant. I, I think he lacks the foresight. Uh, he does not have the necessary personnel in order to do that. So what happens is that he becomes reliant on people in Congress who have a political agenda, one that's not particularly well informed, and one that is not congruent with, ironically enough, the health care needs of millions of Americans, to say nothing of the corporate presumptions to go around a business model that's predicated on government subsidies for health care. The first hundred days under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, <coughs> he put in place things that had never been. Social Security, we had never had welfare, we had never had unemployment insurance, we had never had any money for foster kids or kids who were in orphanages. He put all that in. And the Democrats controlled the political process from 1935 all the way up to 1994 when Newt Gingrich got in. Now, when Mrs. Clinton tried to put in <clears throat> health care, the Republicans said, if we allow the Democrats to put the last piece of the social contract in place, that is health care for everybody, we will never get rid of them. So we have to kill them. And Obama's success, what Obama did, Mrs. Clinton failed. They killed her health care plan in 1963 64. Uh, excuse me, 19. <laughs> and I forget what year I'm in. 93 94. And so we waited. I was in Congress all this time waiting, thinking we'll get it again. And here comes Obama. And Obama established the principle that every American is entitled to health care. That's the only thing he really did with the Accountable Care Act. The other things, how it works and all that stuff is all kind of, that's embroidery around the edges of a basic change. And the Republicans immediately said, we got to take this out. That's why they voted 66 times in the last seven years to get rid of it. And oh, Trump thought that all that stuff was for real. He thought they really were trying to, they were going to get rid of it. So he came in and tried to do it immediately, and the fact was, not only are the constituent groups that uh, Dave talked about there, there's also people with pre-existing conditions. Previously, the insurance companies could deny you insurance if you had a pre-existing condition. Well, if you had cancer or you had this or you had, a woman was denied she could, because she was going to have a baby. So you could, that's a pre, you know, she might have a baby. So there's all kinds of reasons why people couldn't get insurance. Obamacare took that out. It was a second group that he took out. The middle class children in our country would go to work for a company and wouldn't have health insurance. And the parents would worry, what's going to happen to my kids if something happens? 
Obamacare said you could stay on your parents' health insurance until you're 26 years of age. So when they start trying to repeal this thing, they're going after the middle class and their children and everybody in the country who has a pre-existing condition. And as I look out on this audience, there are plenty of pre-existing conditions which would prevent you from getting insurance under the old scheme. And Obamacare insulated you from that. So this is what this is what he never, Trump had no idea what he was getting into. That he was running up against, the people didn't like this Obama <coughs> somehow they was made to think was a bad idea. But the things that was in it were really good for them. And that's what they wanted. And they were, there's no way they're going to take it out. That's why I joked and said, <laughs> they're going to replace Obamacare with the Affordable Care Act. And the people will, the name will have been changed, so the people will think it's different. But it ain't one single bit different. Let's, uh, let's move to a slightly different topic. Let's talk to Dr. Prudence Flowers for a second. Um, so, Trump's first 100 days were packed with decisions and actions that many would label as anti-women. <coughs> From a symbolic point of view, his cabinet has only four women and none in the major positions. But also substantively, his administration has pursued and supported anti-women policies. So how bad for women's rights have the first 100 days actually been? Um, and I like that there's no option there for me to really say, oh, it's been fine. <laughs> um, I'll begin with two kind of anecdotes that I think reflect probably the popular mood, and then I'm going to try and debunk that a little bit. So it was, it was very commented that the day after Trump's big, best inaugural attendance. There was a much larger, much more visibly present women's march, um, which happened around the country and also internationally. And there was a kind of sense within that that women saw the Trump administration as a crisis in terms of gender. And another uh, thing I've seen bandied around quite a lot at the moment is the fact that in late February, Margaret Atwood's 1980s dystopian feminist bestseller, um, the Handmaid's Tale has suddenly re-emerged on the bestseller list and it depicts a kind of a landscape where women are viewed basically for their reproductive functions and it was written in reaction to the Christian right in the 1980s. Both of these are seen or, and perhaps do reflect a public sense that there is something profoundly different about Trump. And I'm going to say now I don't think there really is in terms of what he represents for Republican policy and what he's achieved so far. So the core achievements that Trump has made in terms of anti-women achievements um, have been, uh, in short order, so the, the Neil Gorsuch nomination, and I'll explain why that connects to it in a minute, uh, the reinstatement of the Mexico City policy, um, he's also, um, sorry, the Senate has also uh, allowed the states to interfere with block grants to Planned Parenthood, a series of things relating essentially to women's health, uh, all of which are widely interpreted as anti-women achievements, but all of which are standard Republican goals and Republican Priorities. Uh, during the, the debate we had, or the discussion we had on the day of the election, Barbara Baird and I both pointed out that it wouldn't really matter which Republican took office, certain things would shape how they approached Supreme Court nominations, certain things would shape how they approached international planning, um, for family planning policy. And in that regard, Trump has been on the same note. He's done nothing new there. Uh, so the first and most controversial uh, sort of most noted anti-woman thing he did um, was on the 23rd of January 2017 when he reinstated the so-called global, global gag rule, which is the Mexico City policy. Um, and this is a policy that Republicans um, have backed since the Reagan years, since 1984, and it's a policy that Democrats have opposed um, with equal vim, and basically whenever you have a Republican in the White House, they reinstate this measure. And the Mexico City policy is a ban on um, the use of US foreign aid, um, but I should note it's not a ban on using foreign aid for abortions because that's been banned since 1973. It's a ban on giving foreign aid to NGOs that talk about, mention, even acknowledge that abortion exists. So it's called a gag rule because it's a ban on speech. It's not a ban on practice. US dollars have never gone to performing abortions overseas. Um, what is interesting here, what Trump did do that was different, because you know George Bush Jr. reinstated it in 2001, uh, what Trump did do that was different was he expanded the reach of this policy. And this is credited not so much to Trump, but to his Vice President Mike Pence. And I think that is where Trump is possibly a more um, hardline um, politician when it comes to anti-gay, anti-women 
um, measures is, is more in his choice of vice president who represents a very specific element of the Christian right. So the Mexico City policy and its new guise will affect not just block grants for um, family planning, it will affect any money given out to aid, um, so health aid, sorry. So uh, to give you a sense of scale, Trump's version of the global gag rule is supposed to impact roughly $9.5 billion in global health funding. Normally that applied to only $575 million in family planning funding. So it's been expanded out to any provider of health services internationally will now be affected by this policy. And that's credited to Mike Pence, not Trump. He's not a true believer. Um, similarly with the Gorsuch nomination, and I should note Gorsuch has not got an on-record position on abortion. But Trump did promise during the campaign that he would appoint pro-life jurists who would overturn Roe v. Wade. And in doing this, he is saying nothing new for a Republican candidate. And in fact, many in the pro-life movement are suspicious about Trump's actual beliefs, given that in the past he's donated money to Planned Parenthood. So here, Trump's nomination of Gorsuch, who doesn't have an on-the-record position on abortion, but is strongly opposed to euthanasia and has used sanctity of life discourse in past writing, it's seen that Gorsuch is a sort of traditional Republican nomination. So those are two big achievements for Trump, both of which are interpreted as anti-woman, but I think in some ways it's giving Trump too much credit to associate them as reflecting anything specific to his policies or approach to the issues. Similarly, um, when it comes to the cabinet issues and appointment issues, he is considered to have not nominated many women to cabinet, but the number he has nominated is seen as roughly in keeping with what George Bush did in his first term. Similarly, um, he's on the low end of um, appointments to the White House staff, roughly 27% it's estimated, but George Bush Jr. was, I think, roughly low 30s percent. So these are degrees of difference. He's not markedly more anti-woman in his approach or in the types of appointments he's making, I would suggest. And just to talk a little bit more about this connection with the Republican agenda, I think the fact that um, there's been quite a lot of uh, women's health issues have been deployed and used strategically in, in several of the debates we've been talking about, and that's because of priorities within the Republican nominated Congress. So during the discussion of Trump care, um, the Republican um, leadership in the House in particular put forward a whole bunch of measures that would have slashed things for newborn care, pregnancy care, and maternity care. They cut all of that out of basic coverage. They were willing to sacrifice those measures to get it through. Um, similarly, they would have allowed states to um, kick unemployed new mothers off Medicaid two months after giving birth if they hadn't found work in that period. There were several measures that went through that were all to do with women's health, none of which came from the Trump administration per se, but which were coming from a kind of fusion of the Trump White House and the Republicans in Congress. So again, Trump is kind of um, being singled out in some ways for these measures, but I don't think he reflects anything particularly new or different. One thing he does has been doing that is seen as a little bit unusual is that he started talking um, because of presumably the influence of it, Ivanka. Um, wait, am I getting my daughter and my wife confused? Uh, that, that was not meant to be a deliberate joke. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, is that he has actually talked about childcare um, and maternity leave coverage, um, which is unusual for a Republican, and that is seen as being because of the influence of his daughter. Um, during his address to Congress, he did mention that he wanted to push six weeks paid maternity leave, although as yet nothing's happened on that front. And in his very new tax bill, he has asserted that there should be tax credits available for childcare. Um, again, this is something that comes from a model his daughter's been shopping around, and it is a model very clearly that benefits um, the middle and upper class and does almost nothing for the working class, and that's been um, put down to a dollar value where um, the Center for American Progress has estimated that if this model for childcare gets through, your average working class family gets five extra dollars a week. So it's clearly not aimed at your traditional female worker or working family. But nonetheless, these are things that are interesting and are potentially pro-woman Trump related initiatives. So on the one hand, I think he's unfairly, I think he's being vilified for being anti-woman in a way that misses the nuance of the context in which he's working. I do think his policies are anti-woman, but I don't think you can hold him solely responsible for them. I don't think he's really doing anything new. It will be interesting to see how the Republicans in Congress react to these areas and ways he's deviating from their orthodoxies around child care. When you first mentioned child care and maternity leave, like, which, which is, especially child care, we're talking about child care in Australia, mm -hmm. right? 
So it's something that's close to, to us because we're, we're having a discussion here as well. Congressman didn't seem to, uh, to believe that it's moving forward. It's, it seemed to me that's my interpretation of your expression. So I apologize if I am. You're reading my body language. <laughs> uh, it's all phony. He didn't have any intention of doing anything about child care or about uh, family leave. Uh, <clears throat> in the United States, if your child is sick, you take a day off work, you might get fired. You might lose your job. You might, you're certainly going to lose your pay for today to go home and take care of your kid. We put in a law and said that employers should grant that. They're granted, but they don't give the pay to the woman who goes home to take care of her kid. Or for mothers living with her, and her mother gets sick and she has to stay home and take care of her mother. They don't get anything. And, and so that, the, the family leave question is simply, they're, they're saying it, but it doesn't, they're not putting it in law. If you don't, put a, you don't put a proposal out and present it to the Congress and say, pass this, then you're not serious. You're just talking. You're talking through your hat. The same is true on, on the issue of child care. Women are expected to work, right? Okay, you're supposed to work, but you've got a kid. Now, where are you going to leave that kid? Well, you can leave him at home with the TV and the door locked, or you can leave it with the next door neighbor who's an alcoholic, or you can leave it with somebody who feeds him graham crackers someplace for five bucks, or you can put him in a real school, a real child care place. That's going to cost you money to put him in a real child care. You can leave with the next door neighbor who's worthless. And it won't cost you anything, except the kid gets no stimulation in his early or her early years. And we have, anybody who's buying child care today is spending probably um, a quarter to a half of her income on child care for her child. If they're in the lower levels of our economy. They're in the higher levels of the economy. If you're making $150,000 a year, a few bucks to the child care is not very much. But if you're making 30000 and you're having to pay $10,000 a year for child care, you're eating up a big chunk of the money that you're earning. And we have not established child care as a guaranteed right in the United States. It's another part of our social contract that's not there. I mean, Health care was not, we got that one added. Now we're going to have to add child care and, and family leave, or we're going to have, a, we're going to have, well, we're, we're already experiencing youngsters who go to school not ready to learn. Because the learning process starts at home in those early years. And if you don't have somebody stimulating the child in those early years, they come to school, they don't know anything about anything. That's the real problem with, with the failure of our child care policy. We put women to work. But we didn't do anything about the kids. And just a quick follow-up to Prudence again. Uh, when it comes to Supreme Court, so the, the Gorish nomination, he replaced Antonin Scalia. So at the end of the day, it's... Oh, yeah, it made sense. It's, yeah, it, 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 it's not going to change. Oh, except oh, if, oh, oh. if you're a Democrat who believes that that place um, belonged to Merrick Garland, in which case that would have made a difference if you said what the Republicans did last year was unconstitutional, then, yeah, that, that does make a difference. But in terms of balance of power... Um, Gorsuch is replacing Antonin Scalia. Um, they share a similar kind of textual analysis of the Constitution. So Gorsuch has said that abortion, for example, is a non-textual right. Um, at the moment, the balance of power seems to be um, protective towards uh, the continuation of Roe v. Wade. Uh, I, I, I would think you probably need two more Supreme Court justices to truly change. Um, to truly end abortion in the United States, you probably need to see Trump able to appoint two more Supreme Court justices. But more significantly, I think um, he could have the problem that Reagan had in that several Reagan appointees ended up upholding Roe v. Wade. Um, so it's all very well to appoint a Supreme Court justice to read between the lines of how they've written about things before, but when it comes to um, to on the ground experience, people like Santa Fe O'Connor and Anthony Kennedy, who were both Reagan appointees, were instrumental in preserving Roe v. Wade in '92. So, um, I do think it's a dire time, uh, especially if Trump were to be the second term. Um, but I think it's much more complicated than his claim that he can appoint the law jurists to overturn Roe v. Wade. He has no ability to control what justices will do when they're on the bench, as as is right of rule. Let's, let's move now to foreign policy.
Um, and let, let's start not going very far. Let's start from close uh, foreign uh, countries to the United States. So let's talk to, to Dr. Josh Newman um, for a second. So we have all seen these dramatic pictures of refugee and asylum seekers <coughs> crossing the border between the United States and Canada on foot. They were everywhere in the media um, a few weeks ago. Now, on the 29th of January, Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, tweeted, and I quote, to those fleeing persecution, terror, and war, Canadians will always welcome you, regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength. Hashtag welcome to Canada. Now, this surely looks like a, a direct stab at Donald Trump, right? First of all, because he uses his favorite mean of communication. Right? You, these days, you don't write anything on Twitter and without trying to provoke Donald Trump because he has sort of like an ownership of the, the means of communication in the political arena at, le at least. Um, and second, because of the subtle, regardless of your race, uh, uh, of your faith comment that he included in the, uh, in the tweet. So how much of it was really an open attack against Trump and how have the Canadian-American relations been in these first 100 days? Well, I, I think you're definitely right in, in uh, labeling this as an attack on, uh, on U.S. policy or also maybe directly at Trump, I'm not sure. Um, some of the information that doesn't get out is that uh, at least one of those refugees, uh, including one of them who suffered uh, severe frostbite and lost fingers in that crossing that border because it was uh, minus 40 degrees at that time, um, has been sent back to his home country. And so have some of the other refugees who have been crossing on foot. Also, uh, the same kind of polarization that exists in the U.S. exists in Canada, and uh, there is a universal acceptance of, uh, of refugees by ordinary Canadians. Um, however, uh, accepting refugees is, and immigrants in general is, is something that Canada can't really escape from. So I pulled up some numbers here. Um, in 2015-2016, Canada's natural increase, so number total number of births minus total number of deaths, was about uh, 80,000 individuals. If you take out emigration, so people like me who have moved away from Canada, you end up with only 21,000 people. And to put that into comparison, there were 20,000 births in South Australia last year. So it's really a, a very small number of, of people. So Canada's growth is dependent on, on immigration more so than the U.S. Um, 21,000 divided by Canada's population in uh, 2016, which was 36 million people, gives you about 0.06%, uh, so it's, it's quite small. Um, in that year, Canada took in 380,000 immigrants. The U.S. in 2015-2016, natural increase was 1.2 million out of 323 million, which is 0.38%. So, like six or seven times greater their population growth. Uh, but they only took in one million immigrants, which is just uh, slightly less than three times Canada. So Canada is highly dependent on immigration. Refugees, from a political perspective, I, I'm going to be sounding maybe a little controversial here, but from a political perspective, refugees are really good immigrants for a government to take in because they end up voting for the party that allowed them to come to the country. And from another perspective, again, maybe controversial, uh, we like to think that immigrants should be high skilled because their skill level brings in you know, industry to the economy. And from a general economic perspective, that's, that's true. But uh, bringing in high skilled immigrants is going to increase competition for the domestic workforce. And so from a domestic workforce perspective, you want low skilled immigrants. And refugees, unfortunately, tend to come from countries where their skill level may not be recognized or they may not have the kind of accreditation that we provide in, in uh, developed countries. <coughs> so in other words, bringing in refugees uh, is a good political move. And since Canada depends on immigration so highly, um, my opinion is that they're kind of stuck in a trap. However, all that being said, it's also very good politics for Canadian leaders to disparage American policy because if there's one thing that Canadians like to do, it's to describe themselves as not being American. And a lot of people over many years have tried to come up with a definition of Canadian 
and we can't really find one. Uh, even our hockey championship is now in the hands of, of Americans. So Canadian leaders throughout history have been, on the one hand, disparaging American policy, and then, on the other hand, trying as hard as possible to secure a safe American market for their exports. And this is no different. So uh, Trudeau is going to make a lot of hay out of, uh, you know, oh, we're such a loving, welcoming society. We welcome all refugees, unlike the Americans who are not letting Muslims into the country and so on. But he's got to be careful not to make the U.S. too mad because Canada's main strategy <coughs> with the U.S. since 1945 has been to secure that market. So uh, in connection with that, I don't know if anyone's seen the news lately, but there's been a major announcement yesterday that the U.S. is going to slap a 20% tariff on uh, Canadian wood exports. This is a you know, five decades old uh, conflict that, that still hasn't gone away. Uh, I would say that the refugee issue is, is not a major irritant to the U.S. administration, uh, not compared to trade anyway, uh, or, or as time might tell, marijuana, which is said to become legal in Canada this year. But in any case, uh, a lot of this, uh, I mean, the, the real fundamental of the relationship between Canada and the U.S. is about trade. Uh, so a lot of the peripheral stuff is, is mainly talk, in my opinion. I think the refugee situation is, is no exception. And when it comes to trade, the congressman, you, you were there when NAFTA was being discussed. Um, this is another not small issue that Trump has raised over and over and over. And when we talk about NAFTA, we usually think about the South. We think about Mexico. But there's also the one in the North. So how, how does that affect the relationship between not only the U.S. and Mexico, but also the U.S. and Canada? And will Trump be able to do anything to renegotiate NAFTA as he has advertised throughout the campaign? What do you think? Well, <clears throat> The NAFTA agreement, which normalized trade between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, uh, has been working quite well. But of course, whenever you have any kind of economy moving, you have some jobs disappear one place and appear another, and new jobs appear, and you have robots, and you've got all automation, and you've got. And labor has taken NAFTA as sort of the thing that's ruined American manufacturing is NAFTA. Well, half of our trade in the United States is with Canada. Uh, we trade back and forth across the border. When we build a car in the United States, the generator and the axles and the carburetors may be made in Canada and they're export, imported into the United States to be put in an American car and then we export the car back to Canada. We've got, we're so intertied with Canada, we can't possibly undo that without the economics of, <clears throat> or our economy being severely affected. So, again, Trump is talking through his hat. He doesn't know how complicated. All this guy ever did was take vacant lots and put up hotels. That's his whole experience with the business community. He doesn't understand anything about what goes across borders or back and forth across borders. And the same is true with Mexico. You can, I have fields in my state of asparagus where you can't get anybody to come out and cut the asparagus because that's, that's tough work bending over all day long with a sharp knife and cutting off stalks of asparagus down at ground level. Who will do that? Mexicans, they're glad to come up there and make $10 or $12 or $15 an hour and ship it back to their family. You can keep all those Mexicans out and the farmers in the state of Washington will plow under their fields of asparagus because they won't be able to harvest them. And that's, that's true in our apple industry, it's true in our wine, the people who trim the vines, all those people, they're all Mexican. And anybody who denies it simply isn't looking at who's doing the stoop labor in a society. So when you start talking about we're going to keep all those people out, you put up a wall with Mexico, well, that's fine. Go ahead and put up a wall. But your economy, your agricultural economy, is going to suffer tremendously if you don't have people who will do the kind of labor that has. So that's why, again, Trump is talking from New York City. He doesn't even know where a farm is or how you harvest 
asparagus or how you pick an apple or how you do anything. All he knows is that he orders a building to be put up, and that's what happens. He thinks that's the way the world is. Well, farms are a lot of people doing a lot of little stuff out there that's got to be done very carefully, and it's got to be taught, and you've got to train them. You can't just hire anybody to come into your field or come into your Barossa Valley. You don't just hire anybody and send them out into the vineyards and say, go ahead, go for it. You want somebody who knows what the heck they're doing, and that's really why... His talking about renegotiating NAFTA, nothing's going to happen. But let's move a little, fo a little farther apart and let's uh, talk a bit about Trump and Russia. Uh, Mika, what, what do you think uh, the, uh, the, uh, the whole, let's say the whole affair between Trump and Putin you know, started as a love affair, it then became like a fight in between, now we are unsure where it's at, what, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, to begin with, I'm a little bit puzzled by Trump's fascination with uh, Vladimir Putin, really. It's, uh, he was a strong supporter of sort of Putin's character, the way he does business in Russia, and, uh, and that was puzzling and troubling at the same time. Um, but it, presumably, he, Trump, wanted to portray himself as an outsider to the Washington, so he took an odious you know, character and then said that look we can do business which is you know, contrary to a lot of uh, mainstream politics in Washington and he said and I can do that and I can sort all sorts of issues including the Middle East and you know all Syria and problems with Russia and but in the meantime there have been some some very peculiar and troublesome development in his campaign and that's there are a few investigations now in Congress in the House and by FBI uh, of the ties between Trump campaign and Russia and the resignation of his security advisor, Michael Flynn, um, indicates that there were very close collaborations between the campaign and, and the, uh, the Russian government. So that is, uh, that is very troublesome. And essentially by endorsing Putin early on and saying that he's going to be friends with him and having this backfired in his face early on, he created a very toxic environment. So he's, he, he's, he's not going to be anywhere close to establishing any good relationships with Russia. In fact, now he's probably trying to distance himself. And for example, the airstrike in Syria, which is directly contrary to the Russian interest, he was sort of slap in the face to Putin. And, uh, and Trump is reasserting himself as, look, I'm not pro-Putin guy. I have nothing to do with Putin. And, uh, he, so, so he is he is pivoted in this climate, and uh, he is distancing himself now from Putin. But that doesn't eliminate that there are strong ties and connections. For example, Rex Tillerson, his uh, Secretary of Energy, has very strong ties to Russia. And again, it's very troublesome that uh, they have a strain right now. But underneath this political strain, there is still a strong economic interest there, and. Uh, there's if, if the way it, it will, may develop in the future is that uh, politically they will sort of slam Russia for human rights abuses and bombing you know Syrian uh, civilians, but at the same time they will be trying to undermine the sanctions and try to like for example recently there is a uh, request to. Uh, for example, from the Department of State to do business with Russia or some energy companies. So they can try to uh, sort of have it both ways, have your cake at the same time. So, um, we'll see where it, uh, where it develops. But so far, politically, he's going to steer clear of Putin, but economically, he'll try to still do some negotiations to whenever he can. Yeah. And let's stay in the global stage and let's talk to Dr. Marion Kelton for a second. So, on the global stage, Trump has been quite active in these first 100 days. The salient decisions clearly have been that of retaliating against the Syrian government for the use of chemical weapons that Nico just mentioned, the somewhat overrated and overblown release of the mother of all bombs um, in Afghanistan, and a continuous, not so subtle bickering, I would say, with North Korea um, that sort of like continues throughout the, the last few weeks. Um, what can you tell us about the state of the regional alliances of the United States under Trump, given these first 100 days? Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you for the invitation. 
So first, the precision strike in Syria and then the scale of the strike in Afghanistan is meant to be a show of strength, um, both for allies but also for the domestic market and also meant to be a product differentiation with the Obama administration. Um, regional allies, what are they thinking at the moment? Well, they're looking to the uh, Trump administration and they are seeing inconsistency, they are seeing coherence and they are seeing impulsivity, and very much as Jim has described. What also, what also they are concerned about is that Asia policy seems to be run by a skeleton crew, so they are concerned with cuts to State Department, um, and they are very much concerned about, um, as Rod's rightly said, North Korea, and we might come to that later. Um, what is it that they want? They're existing in an uncertain environment and what do they want risk mitigation? And I think I might just talk a little bit to that because the two strategies the United States has had in place for several decades is to address problems with individual agency, change of personnel that might increase uncertainty. So what have they done? What has the United States been working on for years in conjunction with their allies? They've been working on trust and cooperation both top-down, and we see that through um, legal instruments of treaties, so if you think about Australia, United States, uh, United States, Japan, United States, South Korea, MOUs, agreements, really trying to build structural integrity into those relationships that are going to transcend uh, a range of individual agency problems. And we can also see this not only from the top-down, but we can see this from the bottom-up as well. We can see military to military relationships, we can see training, we can see exercises, we see um, intelligence gathering, intelligence sharing, intelligence analysis. All the while attempting to build, in very functional cooperative ways, much better um, long term healthy resilient relationships. And I think that even though we have this change at the top, um, allies still can turn back to those assurances. And I, and I think we see, um, we see Turnbull, I think we see Abe, I think we see the South Koreans looking to those assurances. So we see that on the one hand, that strategy, trust and cooperation. And I might just put in a little ad here, we've got two of our stellar postgrads in the audience, Jesse Barkagawa and Sean Troth, who are working on trust and cooperation in these alliance relationships. Okay, so we see that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we see the United States over decades since World War II has endeavoured to maintain its preeminent, hegemonic, dominant position. So even though we might say inconsistency, impulsivity on the part of Trump, that's not, absolutely not, what we would say about Defence Department strategy. And what has that done over decades? Endeavoured to establish through technological innovation, US position. And we see this, and some of you might understand that through the United States offset strategies. We see that in nuclear weapons, we see this in precision guided missile systems, and now we're seeing it in loosely based um, cyber strategy. What is it the United States is really endeavouring to advance on and to really establish its preeminence? Cyber strategy, what does that mean? Getting artificial intelligence, autonomous systems into the battle space. Increasing your battle space situational awareness so that not only you can dominate that space, but you can then do that with allies. And if I look to the United States and I look to the Defense Department, what are they saying? Learning machines, human-machine collaboration, assisted human operations, um, better autonomous systems. Now put that into the battle space and be seen to be doing it and spending extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, large amounts of budget funds on that. And not only do you develop those capacities, but you also develop internationally and for your allies a perception that you're doing that and a perception of strength. And ultimately that's really attractive for allies who are existing at the moment in this very uncertain um, strategic world. So here's two strategies, two interesting strategies, trust and cooperation and cyber strategies that really mitigate against these problems of individual agency at the top. <coughs> C, 
seek to provide assurances for allies in this scenario. Excellent, very good. Um, now, before we move to, uh, before we move to, uh, to questions from the audience and from Facebook, so if you're following us on Facebook, remember, you can post your questions at any time, so go ahead and post them and we will be able to handle them here. But before we move towards the uh, questions, I would like you to, to finish with Professor John de Bats. Um, so, given everything we said today, um, from uh, domestic politics all the way to the international, the role of the U.S. in the international arena that Marianne just summarized um, for us, what do you think the future of the Trump administration will be? Now, we still have 1,360 days with Donald Trump. <laughs> After that's after his first 100 days go by. Remember, the, for the 100 day landmark is April 29, so we're still a couple of days off um, that, that, that mark. But those could be 2,820 days if he gets a second term. So, what do we think we can expect of those thousands and thousands of days with him? Well, thank you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple question to answer. So, uh, I think if I uh, got that right, I would be a, a, a wealthy person, um, and it would be unlike my election prediction, which once again was wrong, uh, so I'm not sure that the, the capacity to produce a, a right answer from that. But, but let me start with this, that we have to remember that Donald Trump won the election by winning democratic states that he wasn't supposed to win. Uh, he won uh, the blue wall, uh, the industrial states from Pennsylvania across to Wisconsin, uh, and that's why you want, if you look at the, uh, the election results, you say, where did those last critical electoral college votes come from? They came from those democratic states. So it's important to recognize that underneath all this and all our reaction to the Trump administration is a society uh, and an economy, uh, which was obviously producing grave problems. Uh, and there are a million measures of that uh, showing the absence of any real growth uh, in the middle class uh, income uh, over about a 15-year period. So you have, to, you have to begin with an understanding of a large level of discontent. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, Trump's electoral strength was, uh, in some sense, uh, Roosevelt's uh, strength. Uh, Appalachia, uh, which um, has now one of the highest rates of drug addiction uh, the United States has ever seen, uh, voting overwhelmingly, uh, county by county by county, uh, for Trump. So there is out there in the real world, the real political world, a uh, constituency that is pretty unhappy with what went before uh, and uh, wants something different. Uh, what Trump uh, did uh, in the campaign was to be not a Republican. Uh, and indeed, politically, it's not clear if, if you actually counted up his donations or, or his votes, if we knew uh, how he voted, if he'd be a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, so that there's a level of ambiguity here and uncertainty uh, on his part. Uh, and my uh, interpretation of why uh, why he won, which of course no one expected to happen, including me, um, is that uh, he almost by accident uh, latched on to a constituency uh, that was very angry, angry and looking for the most angry person in the room. And he was the most angry person in the room. So the question is, what does he do with that? Well, point two <coughs> is that he is the only American president ever to be elected who's had no military experience and no political experience. Uh, that's never happened before in America. <coughs> so here's someone who comes to this position with, with really no, uh, no experience uh, at all. Uh, he's never been elected to any political position ever. Never been elected to anything, political or non-political. So the question really is, what's the learning curve? Uh, you know, if this goes on for a thousand days or two thousand days, what's the learning curve? And that's obviously very, very difficult to predict. And as I say, if we all could, we could do that and 
uh, we could set ourselves up as the <coughs> ultimate um, uh, consultative uh, body and become quite, quite uh, famous for it. But let me just begin with how you might uh, make some sense of this. And, and what would you look at to, to try to figure out if this how this situation is going to turn out? You start, so you start out with this, uh, this push, uh, an unlikely candidate who probably didn't think he was going to win, stumbles into this electoral uh, bonus, uh, and uh, suddenly finds himself here. So the first thing, uh, as, as uh, Jim has said, uh, is that um, he's encountered what he didn't expect to see, which is a, a, a political structure. Uh, and the whole point of the American political structure uh, is to force compromise. Uh, it is to defeat uh, an effort to simply ram things through. Uh, you need to cooperate the design of the system from James Madison onwards, uh, if you can't co compromise, if you can't uh, work with the opposition, then it's better to have nothing than that, uh, than that which you want and can't find any support to, uh, for. So what Trump has found is that there are other branches of government. There's the U.S. Congress, for example. Uh, and if I could just add uh, a, uh, a, a, an advertisement, uh, we have here a number of uh, our former uh, interns in the U.S. Congress, some of whom have worked with uh, Jim and other members, um, and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity that uh, Flinders students have uh, to go to work uh, in the U.S. Congress <coughs> as interns, uh, and uh, next year it'll be under, uh, under two different programs, uh, which is a bit of a change. So uh, uh, Trump has found that there is a Congress, uh, and the uh, members of his own party uh, can resist him and have resisted him. Uh, so that his effort to get through uh, the repeal and replacement of Obamacare failed, not just because Democrats opposed it, but because Republicans opposed it. Now, what that <coughs> demands is a president who goes in and actually works with individual members of Congress to get their votes. You can't sim simply sit in the White House and expect that even Republicans are going to vote for him, because they obviously didn't, and his biggest embarrassment has come at the hands of his own political party. Uh, and secondly, he's discovered the courts, again, as Jim said, who, who sit there independently, and they are not going to let through something which individually, as judges and justices, they don't believe in. Uh, and so they will defeat him. There's no way he can cajole them, but he can certainly learn to craft legislation which might get through, which obviously he didn't do. So. Those are, the, those are the sort of obstacles, the learning curve that has to be overcome. Start with a relatively low base. Uh, what's the likelihood that this president can do that? Well, to my mind, the very, very best uh, person who's ever tried to explain that uh, is Fred Greenstein uh, in his book, The Presidential Difference. And what Greenstein does is to identify six different characteristics of what makes a successful president and a successful presidency. And without going through all those, I'll just list them off it. So it's sort of vision, knowing where you want to go, uh, and having a clear sense of finding that correct path. So the question would be, uh, can Donald Trump, after these defeats, find the correct path for doing the things that he says he wants to do, to repeal and replace the uh, 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 Affordable Care Act? Well, that's possibly he can, but it's a very, very tricky business. And the second one is, uh, is cognitive style, which is really to how to sort out the advice that you have uh, when the bureaucracy is finally fully placed. Uh, it'll be full of advice. Um, members of the U.S. Congress are always happy to give advice to the president, I do believe. Is that, that correct? Uh, and uh, the question is, how do you sort out that advice, and how do you... How do you engage in it enough to craft the legislation uh, that you want? The third one is political skill, something that Lyndon Johnson was a, a master at. Uh, can Donald Trump get in the trenches uh, and convince Jim uh, to support him uh, on a new health care program? Uh, now, some Republicans have, been, have done that very successfully. So, in fact, one of, one of the most remarkable things that uh, Congressman McDermott did 
was to work with the Bush administration to get through the massive aid program for AIDS in Africa. Uh, and so it is possible. Uh, and we've got someone who can <coughs> uh, the way in which a bipartisan policy can actually be worked out. Does Donald Trump have the skill to do that? Well, you have to say not so much so far. Uh, the fourth one is a public effectiveness as a public communicator, something he's quite good at, but obviously very limited. So that if you look at the, his inaugural address, which everybody thinks of as something which is going to have some level of grace and dignity about it, in fact, was just a stump speech. It was a speech to his base, but he's no longer the president of his base. He's the president of a country. Uh, and everybody in it. Uh, and that takes a, a different kind of communication. Sometimes you get a sense that, that um, Donald Trump can understand and does understand that and begins to reach out, particularly when his speechwriters are able to keep him on script, and the teleprompter following along, leading the way. Uh, so that's a possibility. Organizational capacity is the other. This is a vast, huge operation that, that uh, Trump is sitting on the top of. He's not in charge of it. He's simply sitting on top of it. And you know, from an Australian point of view, you have, to real, you have to realize how relatively, compared to an Australian prime minister, how relatively weak an American president is. Almost no domestic command authority at all, and not even very much foreign command authority. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, and one of the reasons that Jim could be independent of any president is because he is not just elected by his 700,000 uh, residents of, of Western Washington, uh, Seattle, uh, but they are the ones who choose him to be their nominee. So it's not just the, uh, the election, it's the nomination which is in the public hands. And this gives to um, uh, uh, any member of Congress a great deal of, of independence and autonomy. Whether or not you can work through uh, all that um, uh, organizational complexity, I think, is, a, is a, an issue. And the last one is the most important one that Greenstein identifies, emotional intelligence. Uh, and this is something that um, uh, I, I think is really quite interesting. It's a, it's a an assessment of attributes. And what it really means is to be conscious of your weaknesses and to be able to overcome them, to acknowledge them and overcome them. So what are Donald Trump's greatest weaknesses? Well, this kind of verbosity, uh, this arrogance. Uh, you, you, you don't get too far with that. Those are not the attributes that you need. So at the end of this is a, uh, a, a real challenge to someone with the, if you want, personal attributes of Donald Trump. Can he actually do this? And I think that the Greenstein template is a, is a wonderful way uh, to, for us all to follow this along and say, OK, if this is going to work, if it's going to be you know, 1,000 days or 2,000 days, these things probably have to happen. And we can sort of keep score. Uh, does this seem to be changing or not? And the final point I'd make is, you know, has anything positive happened in this? And we've had a shot uh, at some of that. But here are, here are a few other things to, to think about. Uh, perhaps, first one, perhaps uh, Donald Trump simply inherited the Obama recovery. Uh, and all the measures we have at the end of, uh, of Obama's administrations uh, was that the United States was finally recovering from one of the great, the deepest recessions it has ever had <coughs> since measurements began uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and and this, this recession that the United States fell into was steeper and deeper and slower to recover than anything the United States had experienced. It probably wasn't that far from becoming a depression if the right actions hadn't been taken, if Obama hadn't done what he did. This could have been another Great Depression. It was quite a scary thing. Uh, so the economy was moving up. On, but what has happened since Trump took office is that the sense of confidence, if measured by the Pew uh, public um, polling, which is the best there is, I think, in the United States, 
uh, is that uh, economic confidence seems to have been uh, increased. Uh, and certainly the stock market has gone way, way up, uh, something that no one expected. Uh, it's gone, you know, everybody thought it was going to be a crash. Well, it wasn't. It was actually the opposite of a crash. So uh, that's, that's perhaps uh, some kind of encouraging uh, statement. Second thing is taking a hard line on some of the recidivist uh, foreign countries, uh, particularly Syria uh, and, and North Korea, which has won him uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, support. Uh, so he's kind of learning that a president can be more successful in foreign policy, perhaps, as long as he doesn't get us into a war, uh, more successful in foreign policy than in domestic policy. And perhaps that's something that we're seeing. Um, the third thing that's interesting, I, I found interesting that the uh, statement, I think just yesterday, of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which said that it was, it was no longer uh, going to uh, continue uh, to um, uh, criticize protectionism. This is a remarkable change. Uh, and so it's almost an acknowledgment that the trade environment has changed. Now, of course, that's not Donald Trump. It's Brexit as much as it is anything else. But this is a big change from uh, the IMF, you know, really, really pushing free trade, which was why it was set up, after all, at the Bretton Woods Agreement in the middle of World War II uh, to promote free trade. And so it's almost as if some of the negatives of free trade, which is something the Democrats have generally been uh, more aware of than the Republicans, is finally being accepted perhaps at, an, at a high, high institutional level. And I think that's, uh, that's a kind of an interesting uh, development. So IMF says it's dropped its pledge to fight protections. That's a big deal. Uh, that, uh, that, that changes the trading world changes it for Australia, changes it for the United States, which is not as big a trading partner with the world as, uh, as Australia is, because it's got such a big domestic economy, but it's a big deal there too. Fourth thing I'd say is that some of Trump's most problematic appointees have been slowly uh, moved out of the scene. Uh, and none of those is more important uh, than uh, Stephen Bannon, uh, who was there at the, at the absolute center of everything, uh, and uh, now is being uh, quite decidedly shifted to the sidelines. So you say, well, that's a kind of a learning experience. Uh, I think he's learned uh, something from his defeats at the hands of the US Congress and the US court system. Uh, he hasn't continued to attack uh, in the way that he did initially, denouncing a judge because he was a judge, and that was the judge's job, to be a judge. Uh, he's sort of accepted that now, and you know, probably reluctant, but he has accepted it. Uh, he now seems to have accepted that the wall will exist somehow, uh, even if it's not funded. Uh, perhaps the general donation program uh, could, uh, could, could be um, tax deductible donations that might do it. Um, uh, and I think he's begun to recognize the, the, the huge problems that are associated with um, Re replacing, uh, or probably more likely, uh, amending um, the Affordable Care Act. Um, perhaps to take out the compulsory mandate that was there. Uh, who knows what other bargains will have to be struck uh, with the U.S. Congress. But I think some of these have been um, uh, accepted. Uh, and the lashing out that we saw initially I think has dissipated uh, to some uh, degree. Uh, and I think perhaps he's begun to learn, maybe, that some of this impulsiveness uh, uh, doesn't actually play very well, uh, even amongst his base. So that is not an answer, but it's saying at least those are the things I think we could watch. Those are the, that's a template that we could use to try to make sense of this. And those are some indicators uh, that may tell us where things are going. But I accept that for every one of those, uh, there is an equally uh, negative uh, reading that uh, is distinctly possible. So, yeah.
that's all I see. Thank you. Thank you, though, for the great summary. Um, now, I do have a sign that we did get some questions from Facebook. So while um, we get organized, and then I saw also that the Center Star was able to join us. So I will start the Q&A session by asking, I know it's pretty much what I've done uh, throughout the evening, but I'll start asking the questions of the Center, and then we'll, we'll pass to Don for the uh, Facebook Q&A and also questions from the audience. So, Cassandra, we haven't talked about the environment at all because you're not here. Um, but now that you are, when it comes to the environment, the Trump administration has, extremely, has been extremely active and productive in these first 100 days. Coal mining, Keystone and Dakota Access Pipelines, and a number of other controversial decisions, especially concerning the EPA, have clearly put Trump and his administration in the camp of the environmental skeptics. Now, how damaging to the environment have these first 100 days been, and why? Um, I think the first 100 days have been potentially very damaging for the environment. And I'm quite interested in Don's comments about um, that perhaps um, the Trump administration's successes have been more pronounced in the foreign policy arena. And I would say, actually, that it's the reverse for the environment that one of the things that Trump um, promised to do quite early on in the campaign was to remove the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement. And um, they haven't been successful in even deciding to do that yet at this point. Um, they seem to be paralysed and perhaps it's taking account of some of that early learning um, that this would produce some significant diplomatic problems, particularly with China and the EU. Uh, where they have had success in the first 100 days in relation to the environment in terms of their agenda of reopening America for business has been in domestic environmental regulation in particular. Um, and this is not an uncommon aim amongst Republican governments, but um, to, to talk about environmental regulation as something that inhibits or is an impediment to business activity. But um, there seem to be some suggestions from uh, other leading Republicans that the agenda is going a little bit too far. Uh, previous Republican presidents, um, including Reagan and Nixon, have actually had um, significant contributions in environmental policy. So this is setting the Trump administration to heart. And there have been some policy shifts or reversals of the Obama administration's agenda on the, the pipelines in particular, but also around um, oil and gas exploration, um, both on and offshore, so loosening of regulations there, particularly some regulations around methane emissions that were introduced by the Obama administration. And um, I guess one of the, um, the things that makes this easier, this domestic agenda for Trump, is that the Obama administration really relied on the EPA's powers um, to introduce his agenda. And that was largely because of the deadlock between the, um, the Republicans and the Democrats uh, and not being able to fruitfully pass legislation in this area um, during the two um, Obama administrations. Uh, the other, I guess, concerning development is really around the EPA, so the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and it is slated for a reduction of funds of about $2.5 billion and a 25% reduction in staffing. So that obviously impacts its ability to deliver a whole range of programs, um, some of which um, other leading Republicans have said uh, programs that are really important to their constituents, um, including infrastructure programs and the cleaning up around the Great Lakes, etc. Um, and the other area that I would pinpoint as being of concern is um, the US government and a whole range of agencies have always been really involved in environmental data collection. Um, so that includes around climate, but around a number of other areas. And slowly but surely, these data repositories and reports that go along with them are disappearing um, from the EPA websites, but from other um, US data repositories. And that's of some concern to um, environmental scientists in particular. And some of you would have noticed the, re the recent marches for science um, are connected to actions. <coughs> so I guess I would say that um, it, it is going to be quite damaging, the agenda that is slowly but surely moving forward. 
um, but perhaps not in the areas that Trump had originally um, trumpeted that would be his agenda. I think he'll find it very difficult, um, both practically and politically, to remove the US from the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, because the, complex, the, the process of actually the legal process of removing the US from, from that agreement is lengthy and complex. And um, perhaps in the way that he didn't understand that healthcare could be quite so complex. Um, international agreements are also an area where perhaps he could do a little bit. So now, would you like to open our Q&A session? Um, Don, would you? Do you want these first? Um, whichever you prefer. Oh, well, we've got a number. Perhaps I'll just um, do a few, and then the, the audience here might have some questions, too. Um, so, but um, let's take the most dramatic of these quite good questions, which I think will come in. Um, but uh, maybe to Marianne. Um, is the US picking a fight with North Korea on purpose? Are we looking at an actual case of uh, wagging the door? Well, if it is, it's a very dangerous strategy, isn't it? Um, I think Trump has seen that, uh, with the examples of Syria and Afghanistan, that, that strength, uh, but strength without entanglement, um, plays out well domestically. But with respect to North Korea, I think um, Kurt Campbell's observations that the options for the United States in, in North Korea's strategy are only and everywhere lousy. So the ability to prosecute a successful strategy is extraordinarily difficult. Perhaps one, um, one interesting observation we might make is that China seems to be doing a little bit more in terms of putting pressure on the North Korean regime in terms of reducing, restricting coal supplies and also more recently we have seen that with respect to oil as well. So I, from my perspective I think um, to get the Chinese engaged uh, in, a, in a strategy of putting pressure on the North Korean regime um, might maybe could be construed as something of a, a win for the, for the Trump administration. Uh, but I think it's got I think it's got a long way to go. And the other other observation we might say on North Korea just in recent days is that obviously South Korea and Japan are very concerned about what might play out, but they would have received some at least minor reassurance that the Trump administration would be willing to discuss strategy with them. Um, okay. I don't know, well, I'm sitting listening to this foreign policy discussion. That's the area I'm concerned about. That's the one place I feel really worried. Um, the domestic stuff, the Congress and the courts are going to take care of the president. He isn't going to be able to do about half of what he's talking about. Most of it he doesn't know what he's talking about, and that'll all be him. The foreign things are much more dangerous. Um, first of all, he is in charge of the military. And he's the commander in chief, and he can organize a fight or drop a bomb in Afghanistan when he wants to. Uh, he can do these things, and his basic personality is that of a bully, and somebody who is used to bullying people. And that's the way his business was done. He bullied people all over the place. He had them build a building, and when they came in to get paid, he'd say, "I'm only going to pay you half what I took. <coughs> Take me to court." And so he bullied people always. That was his number one personal strategy. You talk about the personality of the president. Now, it's all fine and good when you're dealing with construction in the United States or with unions or with, you know, whatever. When you're dealing with somebody like the, the leader in North Korea, I don't know how you bully that guy because he's as crazy or crazier than Trump is. And when you, when you deal with Mr. Trump, uh, Mr. Putin, how do you bully him? And how do you, and so where, where does this bullying go after a certain point? Because people just sit back and say, yeah, right, okay, let's see you. Put your money where your mouth is. And suddenly he is in a real difficult 
So all he has left then is to make crazy statements like, we're sending the fleet up there to North Korea. And doesn't even know that the fleet's going in the other direction. I mean, this guy is operating off a base of knowledge which is zero. And it's scary to think about the fact that he is in charge of the military. I, <clears throat> I personally think, you know, the, the first thing that happened to him was he hired a guy as his national security advisor, a guy named Flynn. How long did Flynn last? Two weeks. He was gone. I mean, that was his first appointment. It was the stupidest, dumbest appointment imaginable. Obama had fired this guy. So we already knew his record. So why would you go out and get a guy who had been fired by the last president and put him in as your number one guy? So his approach to this is very distressing. And, and I, um, I personally, I mean, uh, let me just circle around to this question of going to be there 2,000 days. I'll bet you he's not there 2,000 days. I'll bet you he doesn't last the whole term. Uh, most of my colleagues think there will be a day when the Republican leadership is going to say, this guy's going to take us down, and he's got to go. We have, we'd rather have President Pence, bad as he is, and as you know, he's one of us, and he knows us, and we can deal with him. But this guy, we don't know what he's going to do. And so at some point, they're going to look at the 2018 election and the 2020 election and say, this is going to cost me my seat. I'm not going to stick with this guy because i got to go home and explain what he did. And if, if you look at Obamacare, and you look go right down the list of all the things he said he was going to do, he hasn't done them or he has failed to do them. And, and ultimately, politicians look after themselves. I'm number one to me. And Mr. Mr. Uh, Trump does not think I'm number one. He thinks I just work for him or I'm a throwaway for him. And I'm going to show him I'm not going to be that kind of person. So that's why I don't think that some of this long-term planning he's going to be here two, three, four, five, six, <coughs> eight years. Um, no, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't bet, I wouldn't bet anything on that because he is too unpredictable and too narcissistic to be trusted with the control of the mechanisms of world politics. That's, that's what congressmen are walking around talking about behind the door. <coughs> Nobody's going to do it just yet because his base is out there still supporting him. They're 92% behind him, according to the polling. But we'll, wait, we'll watch a little time. you just got to be patient in politics. Because sometimes you have to wait until a democracy requires 50% plus one to make a change. And right now, you haven't got that kind of a, a group who wants to take Trump out. But <clears throat> I, would, I would withhold my judgment about how long he's going to be there. But what worries me is if he'll do something in Korea. I mean, do you know how close Seoul is to the with North Korea is less than 50 miles. I mean, you could throw shells into and destroy a city of 10 or 12 or 14 million people. If we start something over there, and the Koreans are scared to death of this guy because they're not sure what's going to happen next. And the Japanese know that it's just sling one over the Japanese sea and you've got a, a missile coming into the middle of Japan. There's nothing going to hurt us. We got no, we've got no security loss. He isn't going to hit the United States or cause any problem for us, but he's going to cut. He could cause a lot of problems for the Japanese and the Koreans, and they know it and they are scared. So there's there's a lot of uncertainty. I've been in Japan 45 times in the last 20 years, and I was there. I know all a lot of people in the government, and there is a lot of concern about what can we what can we count on from from Trump because. He gets up in the morning at 4.30 in the morning and tweets stuff out without talking to anybody. So that's what's, that's what's troublesome. What you want in a, in a leader, whether you like their political, or the, the left or their right, you want to count on where they're going to be and how they're going to operate. I can deal with the right, I can deal with the left. I just want to know where, how do they operate, then I can deal with them.
can figure out how to maneuver something. But this guy, nobody can figure out what he's doing. Do you want to get more questions from? Yeah. Yeah, um, I've, I've just got a more um, important fact. Yeah, I, I know that the American federal government runs out of funds on Friday. Uh, what, 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 and I just want to know what will Trump's involvement be with the funding of the government? Yeah. The government shutdowns have been uh, always on the Republican watch. Every time they're in, they close down the government. For, they think that this is a this is a negotiating technique. If I want you to do something, I'm going to shut down the government and I'll make you do it. Eh, you know, uh, we'll see. And they, a few weeks later, the government starts up again, and what they wanted, they didn't get, or they may have gotten a little piece of it. This is the worst time in the world for the Republicans to shut down the government. They control the presidency. They control the Senate. They control the House. They can't run the country. They can't come to agreement among themselves. How does that look to the public in the United States? They're going to say, we gave the government to these people, and they don't know what the heck they're doing. They don't know how to run the place. So they don't want to create that impression. So what you saw this morning's in Australia, and I opened it up, and there is Trump saying, well, we're going to get the wall, but not tomorrow. We're going to see if we can't let this... Uh, we're operating in the United States, not on a budget, on a continuing resolution that has been running for about five years. And you just run on that same resolution, and they're going to run for into September when the fiscal year ends again. So what you're watching is they're going to extend it to September. And I, I said, somebody asked me last night about how, what I thought would happen. I said, they're going to give him a little fig leaf and say, Here's $30,000 or here's $100,000 or $200,000 to plan for your wall. We're not going to build the wall. We're just going to give you planning money. Uh, you can plan a lot of stuff that never happens. And that's really what I think he'll have as a fig leaf here on, on the 29th and, and the government of the wall. Um, do you think that with Trump never having any po political or military experience or the appointment of DeVos as a Secretary of Education, having never been a teacher, um, never been in a public school, do you think that these sorts of things are setting a precedent for inexperienced people to get into the government? Well, it reflects um, Mr. Trump's understanding of how government works. And, and yes, it, it is a terrible precedent being set um, to have people who have no experience. You, you, no matter who they are, if you, you don't care what their political position is, at least you would like to know that they did one once. I mean, Ms. DeVos can have all the ideas she wants about school, and I guess she went to school. Therefore, she's an expert, right? That makes everybody an expert yes, in education. Sure. Anyone here is qualified to be the education secretary of the United States because you've been to school. But if you haven't run, run the situation or been involved in it or see what the problems are, to put you in charge of it with your only experience being that you showed up every day at Monday morning at 8 o'clock and left at 3 o'clock in the afternoon for, you know, 20 years, that doesn't qualify you to be good person to run. And, and the idea of many times people like uh, our politicians say, well, we ought to have business. We ought to run government like a business. Government is not a business. What you're seeing right now is a businessman trying to run government, and it doesn't work because you've got all these constituencies you've got to worry about. When you're running a business, you run, you run it. You do whatever you want. You can fire anybody, hire anybody, do anything you want. If I may, uh, Don mentioned Steve Bannon, and one of Bannon's uh, sub-agendas here has been uh, essentially collapsing the administrative state. Uh, so there are a number of sub-themes here that go into play. One of them is all of those vacancies that are not filled. Another has to do with uh, not providing adequate resources for government agencies to do their work. Uh, a third theme is uh, Gorsuch. Uh, being uh, endorsed by the Federalist Society, uh, lawyers very much interested in 
eliminating the federal agencies that were put in place, uh, actually preceding the New Deal, but certainly amplified during the New Deal. So part of the answer to your question, I think, is that there, there is a, a, a not-so-hidden agenda at this point, which is essentially uh, permitting the federal government to do what it has been doing, and that that's in the best interests of the American people. Uh, and who better to do that but a businessman uh, who has shown great contempt for the, the personnel, uh, the values, indeed, that are uh, undergirding this, uh, this infrastructure that we've evolved for the last 50 years. I concur. That, that is the underlying thing that is not being talked about, is the desire to undermine the government. They had a senator elected from Wisconsin named Johnson, and he was asked about a law, and he said, I didn't come here to write laws, I came here to tear the government down. This is an elected official in the office saying he's not there to change it, tweak it, make it better, tear it down. That's the only thing I'd add to that, I think, is that you, you, now you see in France um, the likely winner of the presidential uh, election who has no political experience. Uh, and I think the impatience, again, you know, there is there's an undercurrent of real distress and dismay. Uh, and I think you know, you, you begin to see that, not just in the United States, but you saw it in, 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 in England. Uh, you saw, it, maybe you're going to see it now in France. Of the old model doesn't work anymore. We need something different. Uh, having totally inexperienced people uh, trying to run big, complicated structures is perhaps not the, the way to get what people want. But you know, I do think there is a, there is a level of, of distress and distrust that, uh, that is important to, to bear in mind and something that Australia may see too um, in, in the not too distant future. Um, you know, already you can see people you know, with Senate voting moving away from the, the main parties to, to fringe parties, to minor parties. These, these are telltales, as they say in sailing. They tell you where the wind's blowing from. I think they're, I think they're interesting to, to look at. Do you, do you want another? Um, yeah, why don't we take one from, the, from Facebook? Okay, well, here's a, here's a sort of foreign policy question, um, again, uh, but uh, important uh, domestically in Australia. So the question is, is this, that uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull has announced that he'll be meeting uh, with uh, Donald Trump in New York. So I think that's a flash news item. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, uh, Australia uh, is uh, obviously sees threats uh, from North Korea. Uh, what is what will Turnbull do with this meeting, um, and uh, whether or not uh, Australia is moving too close to the U.S. alliance? So I think that's anybody to answer. Let's have an Australian answer that. Yeah. <laughs> what Turnbull should do. Well, I think he. Um, well, the, the, the alliance between the U.S. and Australia is very important, of course. Um, it is one of the major tenets of Australian foreign policy, has been for the last um, several years, since at least World War II, um, for sure. So it's, it's, very Im it's, it's obvious that the Australia will not um, change foreign policy dramatically because of a change in administration. Administrations come and go. That's the way of democracy, right? Sometimes you like the person who, with whom you are um, dealing with. Sometimes you like the person less. Sometimes you have more. Sometimes you have less in common. So this is the way that democratic um, regimes interact. You don't necessarily need to like the person who is in charge of the government of your allied country in order to continue that long-term alliance. Um, foreign policy is based on long-term needs and long-term interest of countries. It's not based on the whim of a second. Now, the problem is whether or not Donald Trump understands that. And I think this has been sort of the theme of the day today, right? Um, we understand that, we, that the friendship between Australia and the United States is a long-term one based on common interest, based on the respect of law, 
uh, democracy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all of the values that we share. But <coughs> does Donald Trump understand that this alliance is important for these reasons, and that the uh, balance of power with other nations as well needs to be addressed in terms of long-term interest of nations as opposed to what he wants today or what he's dealing with. As, as, as uh, Congressman said, he wakes up at 4 in the morning and he tweets something nasty about the North Korean leader. Now, we may or may not like the North Korean leader, but that situation has been sort of stable for 65 or plus years, right, since the Korea War. It's, it's been dormant, but it's been sort of stable with, with minor incidents happening throughout the years, but nothing major. Now, if you poke the lion, the lion may poke back. Is this something that we want to be involved with? We got a warning from North Korea um, a few days ago. It, of course, they don't have the capability to strike Australia. I don't think they do. I don't think anyone thinks they do. But they said that Australia will get its own nuclear attack if we continue following blind the United States. So I think we, we have to be careful in, in jumping on the Trump boat, quite literally. They're meeting in a boat in New York City. So we have to be yeah. a little careful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, um, World War II um, aircraft carrier. Yeah. They're meeting on the boat. Yeah. So we have, we have to be a little literally careful about jumping on the Trump boat, I think, and, and, and analyze the friendship in relation to the relation with other countries and with an eye to the future. There's a question. Can I make a comment on what you said about Turnbull? Isn't for Turnbull, though, the only place he gets his votes is when he gets his popularity, is when he, go, he goes off domestic policy. The week after he sees Trump, our know, budget's coming down, so he's going to go off Trump, get a lift in the polls. It's for Turnbull's benefit, not Trump's. Hmm. Yeah, I'm Trump. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Max, I, I think that's worked in the past for Gillard and Obama. But the question here, and you'll probably see this through the Lowy polling, mm -hmm. is Australians' um, concern with the, with the Trump presidency. So there, I think there is a question about Turnbull meeting with the, the Trump personality as to how that will play out in the Australian electorate. Yeah? So, question on that one. And especially, like, remember last time that Trump spoke to Turnbull, remember how it went. So, Trump is unpredictable. I wouldn't plan my um, budget escape with Trump in order to not deal with the issues at home. I wouldn't be meeting with him abroad because he can get really bad really quickly. Maybe he says he won't be hanging the, up the phone this time, but who knows what Maybe he says something about the intelligence of both leaders. Okay. Maybe it says something about the intelligence of both leaders. Yeah. But normally, that, normally that's true in, in Australian sorry, sorry. politics. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, is it with the? Uh, I was wondering what the panel's opinion is with uh, the claim that Trump will drain the swamp with uh, established members of uh, like Congress and the Senate and whatnot. I was wondering, do you think that? He'll actually commit to that, or do anything or something like that. Again, Bruce. Yeah. Well, I'll, <clears throat> I listened to that discussion before about draining the swamp. Um, he's done exactly the reverse. He has brought more water in and brought more alligators, and they're all in there. And God help you if you're trying to be not corrupt in this government. Um, I think that if you would rank order the problems that he has, that is the number one one that will get him ultimately, is that his acceptance of trademarks from the Chinese, uh, the economic value to him of being allowed to use the Trump trademark in China is enormous. Now, who does that apply to? Well, it, you can't blame it on me. And he can't blame it on Don. He's an American. It's his family that's going to benefit from that. And he's going to have a hard time avoiding the emoluments clause of the United States Constitution that says the president cannot accept gifts from a foreign power. So there are, I'm sure that those lawsuits are being written right now, that they are writing the briefs. And they're getting ready. I don't know who's doing it. I just I know enough about this stuff from doing it for 45 years to know that there are people doing that right now, figuring out how they're going to get it. 
And when that happens, or how that happens, I think is, the, is going to be the real Achilles heel of this presidency, is his unwillingness to show his tax returns. Everybody's shown their tax returns. His unwillingness to divest himself and put him, his private wealth into a blind trust over which he does not have control. He said, well, I'm giving it to my son here. And of course, I'm never going to talk to my son about what's going on and my son. And we're all laughing at him. Because every politician who gets in that situation has the problem of somehow feathering his own nest if he's not careful. And to protect yourself against that means you put it out there and get rid of it and get somebody else. All of us, members of Congress, have to file a report on how much money we have and how many houses and what we own and all this stuff. And the President of the United States says, that doesn't apply to me. Well, unfortunately, there are a few ways that uh, our system was put together to make sure that the President cannot become a king, cannot become a, a uh, emperor. I, I have an Italian friend, an old woman, 86 years old from Italy, and she saw Trump on, on the uh, television and she said, ah, <laughs> we have a uh, Mussolini Americano. <laughs> he mentioned Berlusconi earlier. These leaders who come in with business and bring business and government together and, and make it inseparable are very, very trouble, troublesome for democracy. And that's really what you're seeing. That's, that's why Americans are worried about what's going on right now, is that this melding of business and government into one is a real, you've got to keep them separated, because the government has to protect you from business. Business doesn't care about what happens to human beings. They're making money. Government is to protect against that. And when you put them together, you don't have anybody protecting you. Well, one of the questions in which we can answer is impeachment. So I think perhaps that's a good, good point on which we can meet again. Uh, we, we will certainly meet again if, if that happens. And again, but <laughs> <laughs> Congressman McDermott headed the House Ethics Committee for several years. So if you say that there is a lawsuit or an ethics violation waiting to happen, <coughs> um, I believe you. And I think we, we all should. <laughs> I, I, I sat there for 28 years and watched people prepare the case. And I just... I don't know anything. <laughs> well, but I've I seen will a start lot of booking stuff. a room. I will leave a room booked in the books ready for us to discuss when it may or may not happen. So thank you very much for coming. Um, thank you for your questions. Um, on Facebook, we will um, continue to try to answer your questions during the day if we can. So we will still be posting um, a short answers to the questions we have done. Thank you for joining us online. And thank you for being here in person. So we'll see you soon. Thank you.